Great. Um, so today we'll be covering product usage data in HubSpot and then how and why to launch product-led go-to-market um, using HubSpot and your product. Uh, let's, so what is product-led go-to-market or product-led growth and what is product usage data? That's what we'll cover. And then how does product usage data benefit uh, go-to-market? Um, and then we also have what are the specific user events for go-to-market 101? And then how, how would you launch and manage a product-led go-to-market project? And then finally, we'll cover examples in, in Q&A. And um, my bad on the uh, verb tense here, Islin, launching and manage. Yeah, that's oh, whoops. Big grammar. <laughs> that's my bad. No worries, no worries. And then we'll, we'll introduce the team. Uh, I'm Islin Monastery. I'm CRO at FIA Strategies, and I'm head of the Women in Revenue um, HubSpot user group. Uh, I've invited Sinkri, um, and you guys can, can introduce. Uh, ahead, JP. JP. Evan, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll kick it off. Uh, hi, everybody. I am Jessica JP Zangri. Um, I've been with Sinkri for about a year, head of revenue operations. Um, I started working... Uh, put some context uh, in salesforce.com in like 2005. So early aughts when uh, operations wasn't really a thing. Um, I think my first title was database marketing or something. And technically that's kind of what we're doing today still, but um, I've seen a lot of, uh, a lot of evolution uh, with people process tools uh, in the last 15 or so years. So happy to be here. Evan? Thanks, uh, growth marketing at Syncery. Um, JP, that was the first time I actually learned how to say your last name, Zangri. <laughs> um, I had been with Syncery for about a year. Yeah, it's also so I don't not like to say it very often because it sounds yeah. like angry. <laughs> Makes sense. Um, previously, Airwallex and Convoy, before that, was head of product at an AI startup before it was cool. Um, and uh, before that, analytics, uh, lots of Looker dashboards um, to my name. Go ahead, Nate. Uh, Nate Rebal, Director of Partnerships uh, here at Syncry. Uh, been here for, I guess, the longest out of all three of us, almost uh, almost two years now. Um, been in the integration automation data space for about six. And um, yeah, just excited to kind of solve these interesting problems between systems. And I think... Uh, yeah, what you'll see today around uh, some of the stuff we've kind of discovered for how to handle PLG is pretty interesting. Cool. Um, we'll start off with a bit of a walkthrough of the landscape product usage data. What does it mean when we talk about product usage data? There's a ton of hype around this term. So you're seeing a very um, biased perspective I have, to be honest, about like the trends and the zeitgeist around PLG and product usage data and what um, where there's some confusion, I think, around the way the terms are used, but also just um, an expansion of, of what we mean when we talk about product-led growth, product-led go-to-market, and product usage data in HubSpot. Um, product usage data has kind of now become a catch-all term for user data um, from product event tracking, such as product analytics tools like Segment, Mixed Panel, Amplitude, Pendo, User Flow. We'd love to hear in a bit with the folks who've joined us um, if they use if they know their companies are using any tools like that. There's also just a lot of custom deployments of event tracking scripts um, in apps and and SaaS tools that track behavior and activity. Um, and then sometimes that's sort of where that data ends, and sometimes it gets moved around the organization um, uh, for a few different use cases. Um, oops. Uh, why product usage data? Historically, it's been for the sake of product experience. This is an example from Mixpanel um, where they're highlighting different feature adoption points. Um, you can see it's it's a heavily scientific thing. Um, a lot of organizations have like UX analysts dedicated to um, both defining and analyzing user behavior in order to update the user experience. At Convoy, this is a really big deal because it's a marketplace. Um, that was supposed to happen completely automatically between uh, sort of like a consumer side, a truck driver, carrier, 
and a shipper side. So features like bidding and pricing automatically and how those were getting used in different search capabilities and search types. Um, you know, there was a ton of waiting and data science deployed to understand and optimize those interactions between those two groups within the app. Um, kind of like a dating app, really. Um, so where most of the innovation around product analytics has happened, right, is in tools to collect and analyze user behavior for the sake of improving the um, mobile app or SaaS app experience. Um, a lot of uh, sort of initiatives to bring product analytics, uh, make it uh, useful. Um, like I mentioned, a lot of the times they stop at the product analytics tool this sort of contained approach where you instrument your app or SaaS tool with um, product tracking and analytics. And then those tools have charts and graphs, just like you saw with Mixpanel. Um, a lot of the times though, for I would say like the last five to seven years has been really popular to push data via an ETL tool out to a warehouse um, and then reflect it in a BI tool. And the reason for that is often to do with the way product events are collected and we'll talk a bit about product events. And um, I think it's one of the biggest pieces we want you to walk away with today is a sense for how to have a conversation with the head of product or with the head of data or head of analytics around product events, how they're instrumented and what could be useful to your go-to-market team, whether that's marketing, sales, or CS. Or and what is, what is ETL? Just to make sure. That Thank you. Uh, ETL is extract, transform, and load. Um, some common tools in that category are Fivetran, um, Rudderstack. Um, uh, a lot of teams use Workato. Syncery often gets used for connecting data from um, any anywhere to a warehouse is usually what is a data warehouse like Snowflake, Redshift, BigQuery is usually what um, is referred to when someone mentions ETL in the integrations context. Um, it's about pushing data into a warehouse so that an analytics team can analyze it. So um, what I was trying to reflect here is that basically the pr product events are often a mess and very difficult to know how to collect and analyze. Um, you'll see a ton of conversations among data teams and analytics teams around data quality and product events. And, and just like, if you roll up, let's see if we can do an example. JP, I think you actually had a really good example around Circle CI, around the definition of um, uh, certain activities within the product. Um, would you mind sharing that here? Yeah, I have, I have lots of examples. So let, let me see if I could uh, simplify this for, um, for this talk track. But if I have, you know, as, I, I was a revenue marketer at one point, which just mean my, my remit was creating pipeline, maturing pipeline, right? Um, so how do I do that with, you know, product led signals? Um, well, I need data. I'm a marketer and I need data. How about that? So I needed to get it from somewhere. So I had to get it from engineering. Engineering's backlog was like insane. So it took me months and months and months to get some of this data that I thought was very important for, it was a freemium model for um, a DevOps organization. So I said, okay, um, give me everybody that did this particular event, right? We had Pendo. So I had all these events. So all these people that did this particular event in the last 30 days, they're like, okay, cool. A couple weeks, months went by iterations back and forth, very expensive iterations, right? Um, back and forth. And I got my data. They stuck in a spreadsheet. I'm sorry, stuck it in a data warehouse. I put looker on top of it, wrote some crap, crappy SQL, downloaded into a spreadsheet, uploaded into Salesforce. That's how I activated my, my product usage data. So now I'm like, okay, it's not 30 days. That's, that's good. It's actually a rolling 30 days is what I need. Oh, wait a minute. Maybe it's last 14 days is more interesting. Well, you know what? Maybe it's the last 60 days. So I go, oh God, now I have to do more iterations with the engineering team. So what I didn't do was build a place where I could iterate on my own requirements um, to activate the signals that I, that I knew were, were, were better than my original requirements. I think that is a consistent theme you'll see anytime you try to work um, PLG, PLGTM, product led anything. Product data into GTM systems is cross-functional collaboration that has a lot to do with the bandwidth of the team you're making the request from and the definitions and documentation available. 
and you'll probably end up driving a lot of it innovation around documentation and definitions because often the events that have been instrumented were not instrumented with sales marketing CS in mind. They were instrumented with usability, user behavior in mind, um, or just BI as an be all end all, um, which often isn't aligned with about, the, Yeah, I don't know about you guys, but looking at this slide, if I was to look at it, you know, even now I look at it, I'm like, oh, data warehouse, BI, product analytics. I'm like, this is this isn't this isn't my jam. This isn't my world. Just give me just give me the data, right? So yeah, the, the way it's the way it's been done before is um, slow, expensive, and intimidating for go-to-market functions. So feel free to jump in with questions at any time, folks. I know we've got a nice and small group, so we can keep it uh, intimate. Anyways, that all changed when um, software companies realized their GTM would really benefit from product usage data. And this is a bit of this is funny to me and also wonderful. Like we're 13 years into, you know, we had like a 12 year bull run in the SaaS market, right? Tons of SaaS companies, the explosion of SaaS offerings. And um, it just, it took a really long time for um, products that really help bring sales teams and CS teams and marketing teams um, usable data from their, from what's happening inside the product to, to start happening a lot or maybe happening down market or something like that. So um, this, a couple companies that are worth mentioning that really spurred this on, like correlated and focus really uh, drove a lot of innovation in this realm. And now, um, you know, this was probably the hottest topic last year, right? And this year is AI last year was PLG. If we had to pick a theme of the year, but there's a lot of different tools that play in this space um, uh, that uh, inflection here created um, in fact, Syncery dropped off from this here, but I'm using this with um, Dave's permission from Inflection, their uh, um, marketing automation PLG tool. Um, and um, yeah, the, a lot of different tools that, that solve different pieces of the GTM puzzle. Um, what we're going to do now is shift into um, like what the benefit to the different teams is with um, product-led data, but first... Um, if PLG is such amazing promise as it's been touted, why is it hard to do? The, the primary reason um, is that the product isn't ready for PLG. This is according to productled.com. And usually what's being meant by PLG in this context is free trial motions. And we'll talk a bit about that in a second. Product requires complex figuration. So giving people a trial just wouldn't make sense. Product requires assistance to deploy. Same thing. Giving free trials just wouldn't make sense. Um, also, just think people got really tired of the acronym um, and didn't want to jump on the bandwagon. But as I mentioned before, product-led uh, growth here is referring almost exclusively to a free trial, as in getting people into the product so they can um, experience it before they really become full-fledged customers in some way or freemium motion, right? There's a free version. You can do a little bit. Um, now you got to upgrade to do the stuff you really want to do right now. You don't need either of those. You don't need freemium. You don't need free trial to actually leverage usage data in go to market. And in fact, I think there's a ton of benefit. Like it'd be fair to say that every SaaS company needs product led go to market. Not every SaaS company needs a free trial and freemium, right? Um, Sinkery went through our own evolution with, we offered a free trial and then, you know, we kind of found a few of these were true, right? Like it took some education and assistance um, onboarding had to be very use case specific. Um, and so the, we're actually using uh, a different partner test box now to give more guided experience. Um, and you can kind of call that our product like growth cause you're touching the product, but it's, it's still different than I think what is often meant. So product like growth has sort of been exploded to, um, these different approaches to using product experience and product data to help drive engagement, um, and revenue for SaaS companies. Um, any questions about that though? I know that's a bit of an esoteric concept, really just trying to articulate um, PLG, not equal sign, uh, product would go to market and, and you don't need free trial and freemium, right? Uh, in order to use this data and make it valuable for your organization. So let's talk about what that value is and how we drive it. So sales teams, if you've got free trials, um, 
they became one of the popular mode for removing barriers to entry to a product. Um, there's also, and should be another bullet here, like opportunity to cross sell products, upsell products. And that also uh, pertains to the CS team where you've got data about activities or maybe they're clicking on something they can't use in the product. Um, I was just using a tool, uh, Varos, which is a benchmarking tool for, for marketing channels. And when I click on certain areas or when I try to change the date range, it's like, no, you should go to premium, right? Now they've got that instrument where immediately it sends out an email saying like, hey, it looks like you were looking at this feature, right? That would be a good example of um, product activity feeds to marketing automation, right? Um, to get me to become a buyer. Um, and in that one, I'm in a freemium model, right? Um, but even in a paid product, uh, sales teams really benefit also from being notified of, of activity in, um, uh, in customer accounts where the renewal is coming up and they need to get back in touch and um, understand behaviors. CS team also customer health, upsell, cross-sell, and renewal. Um, signals about product activity are really valuable for um, engaging customers along their journey as they are using the product. Maybe they haven't logged in in a while. Maybe they've paused certain activities or they've started new activities that weren't part of the original use case. Um, those are very product specific things to measure, but they become incredibly informative as context clues for CS when they're engaging with customers. And so, uh, uh, Mark, I was going to go ahead, add in. Um, so a way to start thinking about this too, for a lot of folks on the call might be to think about it as its own form of intent, right? Um, we're trying to use six cents. We're trying to use Bob Bora. We're trying to use all this intent. This is another form of intent, except it's direct, right? So if it's a current customer, you can see are they happy, are they mad, are they hitting errors, are they using it, are they adding more users, are they sharing stuff, right? Um, maybe they're at upsell potential, are they using less, right? Maybe they're going to be churn, right? Um, and then, you know, just like you were saying on the sales side, hey, is this a potential customer? Does it fit the usage patterns of people that become customers, grow with us? ongoing right um so just as you think about this stuff you know don't don't get too caught up on the pieces of the product think of it as very specific intent data that you can kind of plug in in multiple places throughout your business to drive different activity and you know even more than intent data he'll touch on the finance and, and stuff here as well yeah Thanks, Nate. Um, finance, a lot of companies are investing in usage-based pricing models where you actually really need <laughs> to pull that off at scale. You really need uh, product activity, certain thresholds measured and delivered to like a NetSuite or ERP or billing tool of some kind. Um, Non-payment issues would be really beneficial to see like, oh, they are using the product, but you know the revenue is not coming in. Um, alerts like that. Um, leadership, of course, wants to see insight into usage trends and how those map to um, revenue per customer. And that's, um, you know, a multiple system need there where you've got the product activity and you've got CRM and ERP recording the revenue and you need to marry those two uh, for an executive view. Um, and the customer itself, like, I actually think this is a point that's often missed in conversations about product usage data is by connecting product usage data to sales activity, marketing activity, you know, as Nate said, it's one form of intent, just like website intent or, you know, essentially the ecosystem of, of, engage, of touch points your customer has with your business when you're a SaaS product, um, they view themselves as one person interacting with one product, right? A uh, customer of Syncery doesn't think of themselves as, um, you know, friends with Nate Roybal, um, separately user of Syncery, separately, like it, it's Syncery that engages um, with the person. And the, there's big problems when communication feels really different or missing or, or variegated between teams. Um, like if you have uh, one sales rep and a CS rep reaching out to the same person around renewal and the message and questions are different or weird, or it was the same morning they got those notifications, you can have really um, different experiences. You could even argue, right? that product usage data completes the go-to-market puzzle because the product is as much about the customer experience as anything else, if not more, and go-to-market encompasses um, anything that's in front of customers. But separate topic for a separate day. Um, we'll keep going. So what this looks like from an architecture standpoint is product usage events getting pulled across ticketing systems, marketing automation, CRM, and ERP. Um, also analytics and dashboarding for the leadership view. Um, and we're going to spend a minute now on, um, some user events, but any questions before we continue? 
We can also do questions at the end if no one wants to raise their hands now. Um, so uh, a few different user events. These are really common user events to measure um, active users at the company level. We'll, we'll do a company level and company in contact. Company level are ones where they really only make sense when you're looking at the company view. Company and contact are ones where you want to measure them at the contact level, but you also want to aggregate them to the company level, right? So active users, um, monthly active users, daily active users. Um, there's a lot of, uh, there's a daily active user versus monthly active user ratio, which is often used to measure um, adoption at scale across an account, across a company. Um, consumption rate uh, of specific features, or if you have usage-based pricing, you need to know like, um, the account level of consumption of certain uh, features that count towards pricing tiers, um, new signups at an account, right? So triggering alerts on a new signup at account shows like spread throughout an account. Um, on the contact level, fe specific feature consumption um, could look like um, a certain dashboard that you want everyone to go use or just launched. Um, you want to understand how quickly um, existing customers pick up a feature or um, yeah, last login versus days since last login. Um, so someone at the, you know, company X uh, logged in two weeks ago. Um, you got the fixed date for that. You also got a count of the last days. So you could filter to all customers who um, are more than 10 days login ago and run nurture against that. Um, NPS, obviously net promoter score. Uh, you want a sense of users and, and customers and how they feel about the product and level of happiness. Um, a lot of people, I think, are calling into question the value of NPS in favor of other more objective measures of um, engagement with the product. Um, but that's kind of another topic for another day. New user activation and key action and value and time to activation. Um, we'll talk about this more in a second. This is probably one of the hardest things to measure and most important things to measure um, in your product. Session duration, how long were they in the product? Um, support requests per user, referrals, shares, invites, any sort of viral functionality that you've got baked into the product and how those can be measured. If it, any other, um, there's a ton of, there's a sea of possible things that can be measured in a product, right? So um, you'll probably find if you go and dig into your um, company's product events that there's a lot of different things being measured. Um, as I mentioned, the new user activation concept or time to value kind of thing. Um, it's different for every company. It's very hard to measure. Uh, a few things it might look like, um, and most companies have several. Um, Slack had a really famous one that I couldn't remember for sharing this, but um, might be like you create three Slack threads, right? Um, could be a very high value activity you do multiple times. Um, measure time to go from a free user to a paid user, measure time to adopt specific features or time to integrate systems. So at Syncery, we often look for, okay, you've got three connected systems. That's, you know, you've reached sort of Syncery's desired state for your engagement with the product. Um, the goal is to study user behavior well enough to determine a rough equivalent to value. You build a stable metric. You can bring that back to CS and say, kind of use that as a, as a health metric that is um, really consistent and insightful. Um, and also is very actionable. You can then have CS re-engage to say, hey, I noticed you haven't done this activity yet, right? Is there a reason why? Can we help? That kind of thing. Um, so now I'm going to hand over to JP to get into a bit of stories and, and storytelling around how to actually pull off a project where you want to go get product usage data and bring it over to your GTM systems. Yeah, I think you mentioned um, Spotify, and I think they were really the ones that kind of pioneered this PLG motion with um, the notion of a product North Star. So especially anybody that has a, a freemium model, they they really want to cluster all those events and say, all right, our product North Star is, you know, create a playlist, uh, add 10 songs to a playlist, right? So that's their product North Star. So, you know, we don't need to be the Spotify level. We just need to be directionally correct. We just, we need the that data. Okay. So if you'll notice, a, a lot of this isn't as, um, as technical. Sometimes the technical piece of it is less hard, if you will, than the actual definitions 
aligning on lexicon um, for a lot of these. So, so I always recommend that the first thing that, that we do is look at those events, look at what's possible. So let's say you have user flow or pen note and you think in my requirements, like, okay, I need to know, you know, um, exactly the systems that we're integrating with or whatever my product does. Well, Pendo only gives front end events. Well, I need back end events, right? So you need to do a really good audit of where this data is and how it fits into your requirements. So always requirements first and then figure out where that, where that data is. So in tangent, then we could start to work with your CX team and even your sales team that does um, the forming to develop a customer health score. So that could, I think that the, the product usage stuff, and I don't even want to call it PLG at that point, product usage is a really important metric um, for customer health score. Um, if I have, you know, an integration from my ERP system from NetSuite that says these 10 customers are overdue and their uses is really high, um, whoops, there goes my cash flow, right? So that's a, that's a really hard thing to, you know, to, um, uh, to manage, but it really makes you look like a rock star when you when you can really piece those those different stories together. And I think product data there is really important. Um, same thing with I think like Nate, Nate mentioned um, turn mitigation. So if there's not a lot of usage, not a lot of logins, um, maybe 30 days before the renewal is up. Um, another interesting signal that I found there is that if it's 30 days before the renewal, usage is down, and intent for your brand on Bombora is up, they're, they're, they're shopping for competitors. They're shopping for, you know, Syncery replacement, HubSpot replacement, right? So it's, it's, it's again, merging all these signals to make these really important decisions. Um, another thing we mentioned is um, uh, pipeline maturity. So again, one of, one of my remits as a, as a revenue marketer, I had two main things I need to do. Drop sales ready leads into the top of the funnel and accelerate opportunities through the sales pipeline. So if you have a product where you have thousands of free users signing up every month, even a, you know, hundreds of free users, what's to say that you know somebody that's maybe in a lower stage in your pipeline, maybe they're in a contract stage, stage four or five, right? Lower in your in your sales pipeline. What if you get one of you know somebody that signs up and they just kind of hang out in a freemium um, freemium model? I want to make sure that I know that that person that, you know, Evan at Syncery and I have an opportunity for Syncery, hey, make sure this guy, I don't care if he hasn't hit our, my, my product North Star goal yet. Um, he is my ideal buyer. He's in our account. I want to make sure that um, he gets taken care of before everybody else. So it's a, it's, it's a resources um, uh, optimization there too. Um, the consumption-based pricing. I like uh, um, Evan when you pulled up that other that other slide too about um, uh, who does this really well. HubSpot actually does this very very well, more better better than most, right? If you pay for sixty thousand records and you put in eighty k, you are getting an invoice. So they they do that very very well, um, and I think that really again it helps your cash flow at the end of the day. Um, this isn't just um, yes yes revenue, yes engagement, yes better leads. But it's the and, right? Um, answering the questions about um, how predictable is your is your cash flow and how um, optimized are those processes for um, for invoices if people are really using the product but um, but not paying. So we have a few changes we've got to make to you guys' spreadsheet now. Um, does somebody want to mute there? I don't know. There's a little bit of background noise. Yeah, sorry. Okay. So, so I talked about, so, the, so again, the requirements are very, very important. Put it on paper, get a big spreadsheet, get a mirror board, lose a chart, whatever, whatever you, whatever you wanted um, uh, to, to have as your inputs to your, your product events, figure out where those are. Like I said, um, you could say, oh, cool. User flow and Salesforce, they have an integration. Well, I know Salesforce, I'm just going to hook it up and then stick it in a field. Mm, maybe it's not what I expected. Or maybe there's missing information that's in the back end of my product that I need from engineering. I'm dealing with this right now with um, uh, optimizing Syncery's PLG motion. There are things in our product that I cannot get from user flow that are really, really important to my, um, my customer health score. So, I mean, I'm just doing a lot of spreadsheet work and just figuring it out and then saying, okay, I need this, stick it here, 
I can, I can handle it. I can handle it from, uh, from there. So the other, so the, again, the, the product events, um, think about also how they work with your other signals as well. Right. Um, like, uh, think about if you want to uh, implement like a product qualified account motion, something like that. So maybe a product event is better, um, better suited for a different type of ICP. So if I have my ICP in, you know, enterprise tech, I want a different product signal that's going to qualify that particular account differently than maybe a manufacturing company. So I want to be able to build and scale my requirements so I can make those iterations so that my, my marketing programs really generate pipeline. What else can I say there? I'm going to keep going. All right, cool. So the, this is, this is, this is where you have to be BFFs with your engineer. Um, we, we should know our data models, um, so that we know how they, how they relate to each other. ERDs are your best friend entity relationship diagrams. Here's my account. Here's my contact. Here's my campaign. Here's my product events. Just document all of that out and then go hunt for it. So again, can I get what I need if I just, you know, hook up HubSpot and Salesforce? Maybe. Um, what does that data look like? How many calls am I doing? Am I breaking other things, right? So start really small and be really, really conscious about your UAT or user acceptance testing um, before you code yourself into a corner. Because like I did, um, I coded myself into a corner because I was like, oh, my business users said real time. So now the engineers are indexing, you know, a table of a million rows, looking for a hundred, populating every account every time. And it just slowed everything down. So I was like, wait a minute, let's, let's, let's put the brakes on there. So UAT is very, very important um, to think about as well when you're um, creating your pipelines for those specific. I think um, JP, that brings up a really important point with these projects. I think you, you end up kind of taking the role right of a product manager because you're managing exactly. expectations and understanding of like, the data model and best practices, the utility of the data, right, mm -hmm. uh, for the GTM. Um, real time is probably almost never uh, essential since we're not talking about like, you know, banking apps or something, you know, a payment yeah. processing si yeah. situation. Um, and so pushing back a bit on the expectations that, you know, a sales or a CS uh, requester for, for a certain insight um, might give. And then also, pushing hard on, on those who are supporting you with the data to um, deliver it as you're requesting, right? Sort of like a product requirements document framework where you lay out really specifically like why you need it, what it's for, what you're going to do with it. it to, to look like uh, even down to like it's a, a numerical string or it's a, a you know, um, it covers that a, a rolling 30 days rather than a, um, hard and fast last 30 days. Exactly. Kind of exactly. Exactly. Um, and the other interesting thing that you can do here during this analysis, again, this isn't analysis prep. This isn't, you know, quarters worth of work, right? This is like fun heads down a couple of weeks worth of work, right? What you can also do is take those product events and apply them historically to see where those um, interesting clusters are. Um, so as an example, right, I had all these events in the signup portion, all these events in the product evaluation portion, all these events in the product growth portion, all these events in the, you know, maintained use, and then, you know, spending your first dollar, putting in your credit card. So applying those to not only our really good accounts, but our new, our expanded ICPs, I was able to say, you know, kind of with some directionally correct um, accuracy that, hey, when this cluster of events happen, I know that it's two logins in the last week, seven pipelines, um, three projects. So I tried that and it worked. It worked really well. So then I identified the accounts as PQAs, right? Again, as product qualified accounts. Um, and then if there was an opportunity created within 30 days of that, it was influenced. So we kept iterating on that model. But again, what kind of sucked about that was I said, oh, okay, now my clusters are changing because we entered a new ICP. So, um, like I said, it's now 10 logins a month. So again, I had to work a lot of back and forth with engineering. It was a lot of, um, uh, the foundation wasn't built to, to scale. It was kind of like 
building a skyscraper. And then every time I wanted to add 10 more stories, I had to knock the whole skyscraper down and build over again. So just a, a cautionary tale there is just be really good friends with your engineers and your, and your data team to build this to scale. Yeah. This, uh, so, um, Nate, you're a sales guy, so sorry. But you know, when you talk to sales and they're like, oh, it's so easy. We could get you integrated in minutes. And I go, okay. So a lot of these, a lot of these, um, especially these PLG companies will say, all right, we'll just um, point to point connector, native connector. And that's a really good place to start um, where you could say, okay, here's my, like, I can do this in user flow. Um, my event is a login, last seven days, populate a field on the account. So that point to point is very interesting where it gets, um, you know, it get integration 201 instead of 101 is, um, all right, so now I have five accounts with the same name. How does, how does user flow know which one to update? Um, oh, I don't know, it updates this one. And then CX, my CS team, it goes, hey, why is it showing zero records for one of my, my best customers? I go, mm, I don't know. Um, so then you start to lose a little bit of faith there, right? So those point to point connectors work really well if you have a very simple, clean Salesforce or CRM or HubSpot. Um, does anybody here not have dupes or data issues, cleanliness issues? I'm being facetious. Um, but yeah, so so that's where that's where um, some of these native connectors kind of fall down. Same thing with iPass, reverse ETL. Again, go to market. We get we get scared when we see reverse ETL. Like, wait, what do I what do I need to what do I need to do? Am I going to get in trouble because I put a rule in that updates NetSuite? I don't own NetSuite, but now whoops, I'm updating NetSuite with you know um, an account, and then it messes up their invoices, right? So it's not a a full unified picture. So you just got to be really um, uh, really thoughtful on how that data model is is created. I uh, also think, yeah, the native connectors, we all want those to work really well when you're using like the mixed panel amplitude. I was reading through like reviews on a lot of them. Um, and there's a lot of like funky limitations. Um, yeah. Mixed panel, for instance, doesn't send events, which is kind of important um, when you're trying to use events to trigger things in GTM. And JP, you were telling me about user flow um, that you're not able, what was it? You were saying they're not able to. Yeah, there's actually, there's very specific things that are product that are backend um, and not front end. So I know the sessions, I know the logins, um, right? And users created and everything I can do in the front end. But as far as the back end goes, right? So we have a, um, a hub and spoke data unification model. So if we have a customer that uses HubSpot Synapse, right? We Our, our integrations are called Synapse. It's a super, super fancy web book, if you will. Um, so we have, you know, uh, Marketo, Salesforce, NetSuite, uh, Stripe, maybe Google Sheets, uh, uh, Google Suite, right? Um, it's really important that we know the synapses that they're using so we can have more tailored conversations about the solutions that they're using our platform for. That is a backend event. I can't get that from user flow. Couldn't get that from event. That's just how products um, are built. There's front end events and back end events. So knowing, knowing where these things live again is very important in the discovery process, um, number two point. Yeah. Yeah. The last thing I'll say about uh, Syncree on this slide too is like not a fit for every use case necessarily. There are times you want just super fast triggers from A to B where A is where the product events are stored and B might be Slack or something like that. Um, but if you're looking to do something around customer health or, um, uh, you know, yeah, any sort of multi-system triggers where it's got to go to CRM, it's got to go to HubSpot, it's got to go to NetSuite, it's got to go to a few different systems, maybe you have gain site in the mix, um, a couple of Jira instances, you never know. The CS stack can be pretty messy in how it relates to, to the sales stack, especially. And if you're trying to bring product events in there and you need unified accounts and contacts across those systems um, to keep track at different aggregate levels um, of those product events, then that's a really good fit for Synchry. Right on. Yeah, I've had a I've had a lot of light bulbs in the last the last year. It's hard working. You know, um, there's a couple of uh, like Victoria said. There's a couple. You know, we're a couple of um, uh, experts on a platform. So kind of opening my mind to new possibilities is, uh, has been very fun. Um, we're going to give a few examples and also kind of open it up for Q&A here in this last little bit of time. Um, one example of um, 
product usage events uh, and HubSpot that I found pretty interesting was a company that has a very high volume trial motion, um, 80,000 new signups each month, 5 million historical. Um, so obviously that's uniquely high volume um, trial motion. And um, they basically, that all went into BigQuery, um, trial behavior, a uh, bunch of different events. And um, they were really struggling with the marketing automation piece because anytime they'd connect Marketo, HubSpot, anything else to the system, to this environment, um, it would explode the costs, as you can imagine. Um, and they didn't want to pay through the nose for that. And so Syncree is able to manage the um, sort of like qualification, uh, you know, because a lot of people were signing up for the trials with fake emails, weird emails, business emails. So for instance, they would use um, Syncree to manage if it's a business email and they take these steps in the product, send them into HubSpot. If they then engage in HubSpot, send them over to Salesforce and Outreach, right? So basically a flow of qualification logic to sort of reduce the scope of um, go-to-market team's involvement with, um, with all these massive amounts of trials. And they were also doing things with multiple enrichment vendors on this um, database here. Uh, coordinating those with Syncry as well in order to to try to find the business contacts in a sea of uh, mud, really. Um, so th that kind of goes back to what JP was talking about with PQLs. And also if there's multiple of these PQLs, product qualified leads at, at an account, then you've got a PQA um, and getting them ready to engage with sales. And it's really, it's really hard to have all these, these cool ideas and ideas of grandeur. I mean, we're living in, you know, AI land now. So um, what I wanted to do with PLG is again, um, uh, there's, there's a difference between a sales led path and a, and a product led path, right? So a sales led path, you know, get a list of features and then Nate's like, come on, take a demo. I swear you'll love it. Right. Um, but PLG is letting people, you know, kind of play around with that themselves. But if you have hundreds of thousands of, of signups, how do you know where the juice is worth the squeeze? you need other points of data in order to execute campaigns like, um, hey, uh, I'm stuck doing, you know, step one or two of product engagement, put them into a, um, a HubSpot flow where you, you can, you can, you know, outline where they might specifically be stuck. Now, I was like, well, I don't want to do that because I don't trust the data enough or I don't know if Evan signs up that Syncery is already a customer. So I'm just not going to do that program. It happens. It happens to me all the time, right? So getting getting stuck with not being able to execute some of these kind of cooler campaign automation ideas because I just didn't trust my data. Uh, Camille, Emily, Victoria, I'm curious. Have you guys worked on um, uh, like you think about this stuff? Are you mainly thinking of experiences you've had with trial motions? Are you working on trial motions right now? Or are you more focused on um, usage data and go to market for other scenarios, if anyone doesn't mind answering that question. Are they able to speak, actually, Islan? Did you? No. This is... You're muted, Islan. My bad. Um, well, let me see if I can present her. To speak, even just into chat. I'm just yeah. curious if, if the trial is a good conversation point to focus on, or um, we should focus just on um, other examples. We can keep going, though. No worries. Yeah, just put it in, in chat if you're interested in this or if this is like up your alley or not. Yeah, just if people have experience with HubSpot and trial motions and, and what the stack looked like there, right? Maybe there's a mixed panel um, on the trial activity. Um, yeah, so another example, um, uh, company with two CRMs uh, after a merger, right? Uh, usage events across both uh, companies, two different SaaS applications, essentially. Um, kind of a nightmare stack and this may not describe anyone here or anyone listening, but if it does, then you have a serious problem, right? Where you've got SAS application A uh, and SAS application B. Let's say the same person, let's say Evan myself is using both, right? Um, how do you know that it's me using both? And how do you like reconcile that reality to, through the sales tech stack, right? Um, so you have to identify that I am a business contact at an account that uh, should be joined between the two. And rather than sort of warehousing everything and trying to reconcile it there, 
um, Syncery is able to connect the dots between the both product usage environments and both CRMs um, and create one identity for Evan. Um, we were able to do this for one customer. We saw an 11 base percentage point increase uh, in upsell among their entire customer base. So lots of, lots of new revenues. Um, but there are certain times where you have mergers or you just have multiple business units or multiple SaaS applications features that are siloed, right? Um, and you run into a lot of issues where you want to uh, create a reality that's shared across a, a really gnarly stack. Um, can be real tough to do. Um, customer health this is a more classic example uh, where I forgot to edit the text on the right. I apologize. Um, but on the left, two Jira instances, Zendesk and Salesforce. I know that's not a Hub, HubSpot example, but you need to bring user data across the stack to service key usage signals for improved ticket resolution. Um, one customer we did this for was able to reduce uh, churn risk or identify churn risk uh, much more easily, um, particularly having two Jira instances, both pulling in tickets and talking to Zendesk. Um, and Salesforce in a meaningful way um, and collecting that product usage data for customer health that's much more objective than um, um, just like an MPS score survey approach or, or number of tickets they've, they've submitted. Um, yeah. I think that's what we've got from a slide standpoint. Um, so if anyone's got questions, happy to field them here. Um, and uh, curious if anyone's working on projects related to product usage data. Um, been asked to in the past. Um, war stories, like JP's got a bunch. Um, yeah. Yeah, let me get a reward. Cool. Well, hopefully everyone's uh, being productive, getting stuff done. And uh, um, yeah, I, I hope uh, this was useful for folks. Um, yeah, I hope it was useful. Thank you um, for for joining and, and having us. And you, you can reach out to us individually um, for uh, for anything. If you want to want to riff on anything, but just want to drive home that PLG is awesome, but it really sings when it's you know merged with your marketing data, your activity data, your sales data. That, that's what really, really allows us to do all the, the, the cool stuff and, the, and the, cool, the cool programs, answer the fun questions. So happy, to, happy to share any more stories with you guys. Yeah, and thank you, Island, for hosting this, yeah. setting it up and um, making everyone a presenter. That's a good trick. Um, should use that. <laughs> use that always. Um, yeah, no, I really appreciate the time. Um, and as JP said, uh, product usage data has a ton to offer any SaaS company in your go-to-market. Sales, CS, marketing, finance should be everywhere. Um, I think that's going to be the new standard in the next few years for sure. AI and true PLGTM. Awesome. Cool. Well, thanks for attending, everyone. Um, and this will be on YouTube in the next uh, couple weeks. And look forward to... Uh, doing doing more events thanks everyone awesome thanks guys have a great day bye, -bye.